Today, we're going to talk about time-based errors. In broadcast TV, the source for video was originally the television camera. And the synchronizing pulses were generated by the television camera. And this was fine and dandy in the day of broadcast from directly from a camera or from film that was picked up by a telecine because again the broadcast source originated from a camera. When videotape was invented, video signals were recorded onto magnetic tape in the analog format. And the problem with playing back a signal from an analog format such as tape well, if you think of it in terms of how an audio recorder works, we measure an error called wow and flutter. And that's caused by irregularities of the tape speed, which could be any number of things such as the caps and shaft not being exactly true, or um, humidity or temperature changing causing the tape to stretch and, uh, you know, minor fluctuations in the, the density of the tape and the density of the coating. These all contributed to wow and flutter. Enter videotape. And I've got the color bars up for a reason because I, I have, I'm not going to show you just yet. I'm going to explain uh, what it is before I actually turn on the, the picture. But it's variations in the timing signals horizontally and vertically. So we're going to explain time-based error and how we can go about correcting it. It's going to turn on the video now. That's why I was keeping you guys in the dark. What I have here is I have a little setup. And I'm just using a simple time-based corrector here because I want to show the difference. What we have here for display is we have a, a Conrad broadcast monitor and a basic VCR. And I have one of these Videonics MX1 video mixers from going back about 20 years. The reason I'm using this Conrack monitor is because this is a broadcast monitor. This actually came from a broadcast station. It's still got the marks on here. I have to clean the tube, it's dirty, but it still has the actual uh, framing marks on the, the tube. That's for framing for the cameraman, for the director to scream at the cameraman when he was when it wasn't framed. At one time, this one used to have a little, plus, little cross in the middle too, but I took that off. Uh, anyway, we're using a broadcast monitor because a broadcast monitor, like the really old TVs, has three different, basically, well, two different automatic frequency controls. You can turn it off, and I'll show you here. First of all, we can delay the picture horizontally and vertically, which I'll, I'll show you how that works. And we can look at 7 milliseconds or 0.5 milliseconds horizontal AFC, or turn it off completely. We can set it for NTSC spec by pressing the NTSC button. We can turn the color off completely and make it black and white by pressing the mono button. This particular monitor's got the vector module uh, built in. You can use just a regular oscilloscope. You don't have to. You don't have to use a vector scope. You can take the color vectors right off of the demodulator on this and look at it as if you were looking at it on a vector scope. So this particular monitor's got the vector module added to it. And I'm going to be doing a service video on these things because they, they are showing some problems. I'm not going to fix it in this one because this is more to display time base error. But if I wrap this thing, I'm sure, I'm sure that the picture is going to flutter and break up. As you can see. We have some connection problems on there. That was a problem with these monitors, and we'll, we'll do that's for another video when I'm going to actually go through these things. So, you guys that are salivating right now looking at the, this broadcast monitor, You'll see it at some point. But I'll kind of demonstrate what it can do. Now, on a television, a conventional consumer television, the time base or the, the AFC is, is very broad, so it can it can accept signals that are not perfect. For broadcast, to hit a broadcast transmitter, signals must be absolutely perfect. If the timing is off, it can actually blow the transmitter. And it can also cause interference to other services. So to maintain a legal signal, it was imperative that a broadcast station was able to monitor their signal precisely, including any time-based errors. And that's what these monitors are designed to do. You will see visually immediately if you have a problem. Now, why is that important to us today? Well, let's, turn, let's just play this tape with color bars. Now you can see where these broadcast monitors really came into play. 
You see how crappy that color looks? That's that's crap off VHS. It's terrible. But the monitor is set for correcting most time-based errors. If I flip the little switches over here, if I change my AFC, you'll start to see that the picture will start to flag a bit. See the picture flagging there? That's time-based errors. And if I tap the top of the machine, we're really introducing time-based errors. If I turn the AFC up on the, on the monitor, tapping the top of the machine is not going to create the same effect as it does there. Now, why is that important? Well, if you were trying to make a recording of this on a digital uh, capture card, such as going into a computer, if you don't time base correct your video before it's captured, this will usually cause your capture card to bail out and fail. And that's a problem. You could be capturing a tape and say there's an unrecorded section of tape where snow comes up momentarily on the screen, that can cause your capture card to bail out because the signal is out of sync. Here we go again. You know, the, 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 the um, this is just from tape irregularities in the tension, but you can see it's causing the, the time base to change on the tape or on the, on the monitor. So we have two different types of, uh, of control. This is the tightest. This is more like a consumer TV. And this one is the FCC or NTSC spec. So broadcast stations will normally be monitoring their signals hitting the air or at least where when they were broadcasting in analog. Digital doesn't matter because everything's all correct, but in the days of analog, a broadcast engineer would be monitoring his signal going to air on a monitor in that mode, so that if there was any problems, it would show up. Now we'll show you what time-based correction does. And yes, I did have to take the top off my VCR because I did just have to clean the heads from this bad tape. Um, this is just the old Videonics MX-1. It was a video effects mixer, and what it does is it allows you to cross-dissolve between two analog sources or any type of video effects like picture and picture, zoom. It even did chroma key, for that matter, in the analog format. But the problem was to digitize a tape, you know, to digitize video, the time base must be correct. So what this does is it reads field by field, it reads the entire frame in, into memory. And it stores it in memory, and then it reads it out after correcting the timing error so that what goes out the output is 100% compliant with NTSC spec for broadcast. And this unit actually is, even though this was a consumer product, this was a couple thousand dollars when they were new, um, and they probably still command a few bucks today just because even if someone's not using it as a switcher, which you can use it as, that's what it's designed as, that's what, they, that's what they, the handle here is for, for cross-dissolve, or you can do it uh, with a time dissolve. There's like 255 different transitions that you can enter on here. This is basically an effects board is what it is. It's a video switcher, and it'll cross-fade your audio as well, and you can solarize and all kinds of cool effects that I used to use when I was... In the uh, in the production business but what it'll do is it'll take a signal that's crap coming in and it will correct it so that uh, what's coming out is correct and then you can capture that you can record that on uh, on your your capture device now most of the standalone DVD recorders that were sold there for a number of years by Panasonic Toshiba and a few other companies they actually had a time-based corrector on the input to correct for tapes coming off of VHS or high 8 or 8 millimeter and a lot of the high-end Sony high 8 cameras in the later years they actually had a time-based corrector built into the playback uh, circuitry so did some of the high-end VHS machines they had a time-based corrector built in to correct timing errors because VHS was such a crappy format especially uh, in the six hour speed but most did not. So if you've got a, a, a VCR with a time-based corrector built in, that'll do just fine if you're capturing tapes. Something like this here, though, I was trying to capture some tapes, uh, and, and I had a client that brought me 
a bunch of their home videos that were shot on VHS and 8mm and unlike most of my clients that want their uh, home videos transferred onto DVD, this client wanted it transferred onto a hard drive because he doesn't have a DVD player. He wants to play it back on his computer. So I had to haul out the time-based corrector or the effects board to use as a time-based corrector just to ensure that his tapes, which are a lot of them are multi-generation, like copies of copies, just to ensure that the stability is good enough that I'm able to capture it without having my capture card complain loudly about, uh, about uh, the sync being at the wrong level or the timing being too far off and then you end up with pictures that are breaking up and freezing and stuttering and stopping and all kinds of other nasties. Anyway, let's take a look at what this thing does and how it corrects the picture. So we're back here. If I tap the machine, you can see our time base errors that were that are being created just by bumping the machine. I have the B channel, or no, the B channel is set for the uncorrected. I've got it looped through the monitor, back through the time base corrector, and then back into the monitor. If I flip over to the A channel, there's the corrected. And even when I tap it, see that? No difference. If I go back to the B channel, A channel. Uncorrected time base, corrected time base, uncorrected time base, corrected time base. If I really create an error by just manually slowing down the drum slightly, let's see how let's see how wide this thing can correct. Okay, you can see what I'm doing. I'm really messing up the time base here. And coming out the, whoops, wrong button. Where am I here? It's this button here. I, it's, uh, I was changing the EFC. Okay, there's the time base corrected output. I'm changing the frequency so bad that I'm actually changing the color but I'm not changing the, the time base of the horizontal vertical. And there it is there. See the difference? You can hear the drum speed changing as I'm touching it. So that's what a time-based corrector does for you. That's why you need one if you're doing any type of production work where you want quality, especially if you're capturing videos from analog sources. You need to have a time-based corrector if you want the quality of your capture to even resemble what is going in. Without a time-based corrector, that's when you, if you've noticed, if you've captured video from an analog tape and you're looking at what's playing back in the computer and saying, wow, oh, this looks like crap. The picture's all kind of bending a bit and it's twisty and it just looks like junk. That's the reason. This is what's called a pulse cross monitor, so we can delay vertically, so that we can look at information that's in the vertical interval, and I can actually crank up the brightness to, whoops, when I can crank up the brightness, I can look at my vertical sync here, and I can compare the difference between untime based corrected and time based corrected, you can see there, you can actually see the time based corrector working, you see? Untime based corrected video in the pulse cross or in the vertical delay, you can see our our horizontal, and this is actually our switching point between the heads. And if I just so much as you can see it there. Time based corrected side is perfect. The other delay is horizontal delay. Horizontal delay lets us look at the color burst and our horizontal sync pulse. Again, untime based corrected. We've got all our fluctuations. I think my video is a little hot there. Let's just shut that down a bit. I've got it cranked up so you guys can see the uh, horizontal sync line there, or horizontal sync pulse, and if I crank up the brightness on this thing, 
There's our horizontal sync pulse, our color burst, then the start of our video frame. So this is our, our back porch and our front porch is here for each video line. If I go into horizontal and vertical delay, now we can actually see the entire frame. This is untime based corrected, so this is what's coming off the tape without going through the time based corrector. And again, any fluctuation, you'll really see it here. But you can notice here, look at the look at the huge timing error between the end of the frame and the start of the next one. It's just horrendous. That could never be broadcast. That would violate FCC broadcast regulations. But if I go through the time base corrector, you'll see that it is now brought within spec. These slight shifts that you see here, this is actually the time base corrector stepping back and forth to try and keep the video in sync. There's another mode I can set up for this unit and I'll, I'll flip it over to that in a second here just to show you there's because this time base corrector will actually it, it, it's, it's automatically trying to maintain stability and it will automatically keep up with with the incoming video by adjusting its output slightly. There's another mode that I can put it in which will make this thing absolutely rock stable. Let me just do that. Okay, now I've, I've turned off what's called the infinite window time base corrector. So now there's a, there's a setup on this thing here. If you're interested in the MX1, maybe we can do a video on that at some point. But there's a setup function where I can what's called lock the video completely. So now in this mode, this unit is completely locked to FCC standards. As you can see, if I go to channel B, there's our time base errors. And if I go to channel A, here it is corrected with the infinite window turned off. So now it is actually forcing the video to absolutely rock steady, no variation whatsoever. What will happen in this mode is if the video is running slightly fast or slightly slow, there will come a point where an extra frame has to be inserted or a frame has to be dropped so that the video stays compliant because the output is going to be rock stable no matter what. This output is never going to change. It is going to be perfectly stable at all times to meet very stringent broadcast requirements. So if the incoming video was not exactly 29.97 frames, like say it was sourced off a 30 frame source and it was recorded at 30 frames, well, every so often you would get a drop frame in infinite window, or sorry, with infinite window turned off. Normally infinite window is on, so the time base corrector will make very, very slight variations to the video frequency so that the video always stays in sync with the sound. But when it's locked, it will it will keep the video perfectly perfectly stable. But eventually, it will there will be some uh, field or frame slippage, which will then result in a dropped frame or an added frame, depending on whether the incoming video was slightly quick or slightly fast or slightly uh, slow. But that's what this unit can do. So if you're if you're looking for a device that is going to provide you rock stable sync then this little old Videonics MX1 switchboard just being used as a time-based corrector will do the job. It will make sure that your video is absolutely rock steady and uh, you're well within spec. And if you're using it for capturing video, you will end up with the best possible quality capture that you can get. And there's our output compared to my input there's my output and I have some contamination going past those heads again which is going to result in my tape getting eaten probably <laughs> this tape fail <laughs> goodbye I get make a new tape that one is a uh, shot the Steadicam uh, junior again no time based correction. Time based correction. Quite the uh, difference. 
some of the other things these monitors could do, and I know this isn't a very good tape that I'm showing you here, but uh, they could go under scan. Whoops, that's degaussing. I'm going to press here. That'll degauss the picture tube. They can go in under scan mode, which scans the picture down to a smaller size, so you can actually see, you can actually see um, the edges of the picture. And again, the pulse cross also works in under scan. And we could turn off the individual colors on this monitor. So, for example, if you only want to look at the blue channel, you could turn off the red and the green channel. So you'd only to look at you want just to look at one channel. If you want just to look at the green channel, you could flip on the green channel by itself or just the red channel. Or if you want to look at the red and the blue, you could turn off the green. By comparison, you could turn off the blue. You could turn them all off for that matter. This was used for the setup mode. So when setup mode, you would switch the switch to setup and then you would turn on the individual colors one at a time and you would adjust the low lights. You'd feed it, first of all, color bars, but you would adjust the red and the green and the blue individually so that you could just see it on the screen. That's for setting it up. Again, I'm not gonna cover that in this video because I'm going to do a video dedicated to this monitor. We'll actually set this thing up and make it look like it once did this monitor is, uh, I don't even know how old this thing is. Let me see if I can find a date on this thing. This is going back to probably the late 70s, I'm going to say. But let me just check the date and see if there's a date on this thing. Well, there you go. January 1978. It's a Conrack model 5732. Made in USA. Here's the back of this thing. That noise you hear is that VCR is rewinding. These are open frame. So we're gonna have fun with this thing um, down the road. This is the deflection side. So here's where horizontal and vertical deflection. I'm keeping my fingers away from this thing because this thing's turned on and I don't really wanna get zapped today, but um, there's the deflection side. Everything's adjustable. It's got all these big, big ass connectors which cause a lot of problems. This is where, this is what causes all those uh, fluctuations. I remember when I was, when I worked in broadcast, we had this monitor in our our production truck and uh, the guys were always pulling it out of the rack and hammering on the side of it with a screwdriver because the picture was screwed up I mean it just, this thing this thing was banged around it was actually in a, in a production truck you know big motor home production truck and it was banged around all the time so it wasn't sitting in a nice studio where it was you know mounted in a rack where it never got moved this thing here was in the back of a like a 30-foot motor home and every time, every little, every little speed bump they went over, this thing would be tossed in the air, right? Because the back end was sticking out so far behind the wheels, like being in the back of a school bus, right? You know how it is to be in the back of a school bus and they go over a train tracks or a speed bump or something. The kids in the back get thrown right to the ceiling. Well, think about that. That's what happened to these monitors. They were just, they were, they were mounted in racks, but they were just thrown around like you wouldn't believe. I'm surprised it even still works. Here's the signal processing board. This is where all your color circuits are. Here's our horizontal output. Our high voltage module is right here. The flyback transformer, there's the high voltage lead. That thing probably has, now this being a broadcast monitor, it's not going to be no 30,000 volts. This one's probably cranked up to, you know, 50 or 45 or 50,000 volts because the, the broadcast units tended to run at much higher voltages than consumer products did. They didn't give a crap about x-rays. What the hell? Let, them, let, let all the people in the production facilities get cancer. These things probably spew more x-rays out than you would ever imagine because being a broadcast unit, they're not required to fall within the same uh, restrictions as consumer products did. Yeah, it's got some shielding on the picture tube here. Uh, look at the size of the deflection yoke on this thing. Here's our here's our convergence magnets, and this is not this is not an inline gun. This is a delta gun. You can focus in there. I don't know if I can focus in close enough. We'll try. There's the there's the the delta gun on the picture tube. You can see the three filaments, and here's the the three convergence coils for the red, green, and blue whatever order they're in. Anyway, that's a look at my little 
monitor here. So say I've got two of these things. I picked these things up from a studio that I worked at to, when they switched over. I think they replaced them with Tektronics. But we had Conrack monitors coming out the yin yang back in that truck and uh, some really, really old black and white ones as well that were used on like the telecine changes for, you know, making sure that the film was queued up. But uh, anyway, this monitor was probably, you know, this was probably $20,000 when it was new. It was, they were not inexpensive. All these uh, broadcast units were very expensive. Get a look at that tube, get, get the part number off there. See, they even made their own tubes. There you go. They made their own tubes. They made everything, all made in America, this one. Hope you enjoyed this video. We're going to do one on this monitor, so you'll see it again in the not-too-distant future when I overhaul this monitor.